Amen. And amen. amen. God is good, isn't He? All the time. That's right. I remember that. I'm trying to think exactly how it went. I don't know if you remember a couple years ago where they say God is good. All the, all the time. time. All the time. God, God, God is, good. is good. All right, let's try that. God is good. All the time. All the time. God, God is good. good. Man, that's great. That is awesome. Years ago, uh, Don Moyn, I think, won his song. He had a song that, that went to that really upbeat and energetic. All right, today's message is titled, Me, a Transformer. Are right, any of you here to the Transformers craze? Now, we have to kind of remember at this point in time, our kids are now over doing another worship time, so they're not in here. But I did see a couple of hands come up. Who's into the Transformers praise? Right, I'm proud of the Transformers. <laughs> you were in the Transformers before they were cool? Did you make them cool? Or? <laughs> Back when they first, I got you, I understand. The first time along and through there. All right. So, wait, what, is, what was that? I thought he had no idea. It was Transformers and GoBots. Oh, that's right. I remember those two. <laughs> Even before then, huh? All right. So, well, if you're not really on to the Transform thing or the craze, let me bring you up to speed on the Transformer movies. Transformers is a 2007 American sci-fi fiction and action film based on the Transformers toy line. So everybody familiar with the Transformer movie line? The film, which combines computer animation with live action, is directed by Michael Bay with Steven Spielberg serving as executive producer. In the Transformers, there are two factions of alien robots who can disguise themselves by transforming into everyday machinery. Now, how many of you knew that that's what they did? I you have to be a little lost, I'm a little lost in some of that, but they're robots. They can disguise themselves, they transform from the robot into machinery. Three movies have been released. I think a fourth one is in production. How I many of you know the fourth one is in production? Oh, look, man, y'all are so up on it. You know everything about it. When my daughter and son-in-law lived in Austin, you know, they live in New York City now, the third Transformer movie was released. And we happened to be visiting Austin about that time before they moved to New York City. And, and uh, I've never really watched the Transformer movies or been that involved in it. And, but I never miss an opportunity to go to a movie, so my son-in-law approached me and said, Hey, I'd, I'd love to go see the new Transformer movie, and would you like to go? I said, Yeah, absolutely. Now, how many of you know in Austin there's a theater called Alamo Draft House? Okay, pretty neat place. Well, everyone here knows that I can't hear very well, so for years when we go to Austin and Candace or Aaron or even or anybody would prefer to go into Alamo Draft House for years, I thought they were saying Alamo Jack's house. <laughs> I just I thought Jack had a house or something. I don't know. That, that. So, but Alamo Draft House is a really neat little theater. If you ever go, you can you go in and you sit down and there's this long bar table type thing in front of you. There's a menu where the movie starts. You order your food. I mean, you actually get a meal. And during the movie, they're coming and they're bringing your food. So it really is kind of the dinner and movie concept. Has anybody, anybody here been to Alamo Draft House before? Kind of a cool thing to do. So I enjoyed the food. I tried to stay as engaged as possible in the movie, having not seen the first two. And uh, the point being, and it's really hard, even a sci-fi movie, to comprehend robots that can transform into machines. At least in my mind, it's a hard thing to do. Well, even so, it may be hard for Christians to comprehend that they can transform into someone other than who they are. But at the instant we become a Christian, and you'll remember this from last week, because remember the series is this. When you said yes, what did you say yes to? When you said yes to becoming a Christian, and salvation occurred, and Jesus Christ come into your heart and lived, what else did you say yes to? Remember last week it was the eternal relationship with Jesus starts as soon as you become a Christian. You have an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ right now. It's not something that's out there. It's not something that comes later. It's not a place or something you're going to go to, which we know we're going to go to heaven. But the thing you need to know is from week one in our series is that when you become a Christian, eternal relationship, it starts with Jesus right now. And that should be so exciting that you have an eternal relationship with God and Jesus. Amen? That should be exciting. 
That should be something that when you come to church and you hear that and you get renewed, you go out and you're excited because you walk out and you're going, why are you excited? I have an eternal relationship with God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son. It's eternal and it's right now and it's going on in my life. And I'm excited. How I many you tell I'm excited? It's exciting to have that eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. But when that starts and when that eternal relationship begins, the transformation process also begins. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will... Be able to then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. As I researched this passage and began to look at it, I came across the characteristic of the book of Romans. Remember sometimes we talk about it's just good when you look at a verse of Scripture to try to know maybe the book it comes from, the context with, and why it was said, who said it, where it said Sometimes it's just good. So as I researched this passage, I came across the characteristic of the book of Romans. The characteristics of the book of Romans will put this passage into perspective. See, the great, great contribution of this letter to the Romans is how God's righteousness can become man's possession. That's hard to comprehend. And whether we comprehend or not, I don't know if a lot of people really truly understand that God's righteousness can become man's possession. Man can possess God's righteousness. That's what the characteristic of the book of Romans is about. He first of all, realizing that we're in this eternal relationship with God, with God that began in salvation, that's one thing. But comprehending that we can possess God's righteousness, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? See, I think as a matter of fact, I think what happens, most people would consider this process if they even, if they even know about it. And you tell them about it and say, hey, look, you realize that you can possess God's righteousness? If they even know and understand it, I think what really happens is that most people look and say, this is impossible. For me to... To possess God's righteousness, as righteous as God is and as bad as I am, that's impossible. I, that's just not going to happen. So what ends up happening, I think a lot of people look at it and say, okay, even if you tell me that process or that can happen, I'm just not going to try. There's just no way I can be righteous like God, so I just want to try. I'm just going to give up immediately. I think, whether a lot of Christians know that, I think that's what happens anyway. I think they get salvation, become a Christian, they start coming to church, and they start hearing all these things about you got to do this or this, that, and the other. This is the way a Christian is supposed to live, and this is righteousness and how it is, and the whole bit. Next thing they go, can't do it, so might as well just not even try. I want you to consider this illustration. Let's say there's a river that runs right by your house. It's wide, and the water flows very slow and very steady. All the water is flowing to the ocean. This river has a very definite course and a definite destination in mind. Everybody got the picture of the water? It's right by your house, blowing right along to the ocean. There's this little rowboat on the bank of the river, and you decide to get in the rowboat and paddle out to the middle of the river. You're in the middle. Now, once you get there, you can do one of three things, and you can. Number one, paddle against the current. Number two, sit in the rowboat and just go with the flow. Number three, paddle with the current. See, if it's God's purpose for man to be made into the image of Christ, for me to possess his righteousness, I can do one of three things. I can fight against it. I can sit back and just kind of hope it will happen. Or I can work with God in the process of my transformation. In other words, I can be involved in my Christian growth process. I can grow in the grace and knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. I can clothe myself in Christ's likeness. I can put on the full armor of God. I can study to show myself approved. I can work out my salvation with uh, fear and trembling. I can submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I can work with God to help me, help me become me, or me become more like Christ. 
me. Isn't that an amazing thought? God is changing me, and He has asked me to be involved in the process. He has asked you to be involved in the transformation progress as well. So Christians should be in the transformation process. So let's see what our scripture tells us about this process. As we consider this scripture, let me give you a little more insight to the book of Romans. If you look at the book of Romans, in contrast, if you look at chapters 1 through 11, and you contrast it with chapters 12 through 16, perhaps the most important distinction is this. The first part deals primarily with God's actions for humanity. That's 1 through 11. God's actions for humanity. Then you get 12 through 16. The last part deals with people's actions in response to God's. Now that's a lot to say in, in quite a bit of time. 1 through 11 is God's actions to humanity. Can you think about that? It's, it's God acting. God's actions to humanity. The last part deals with people's actions in response to God. God says, here's my actions to man. And then the second part is saying, here's our reaction back to you as my response to God. So chapter 12 actually begins, the part we looked at today, it begins with people's actions in response to God. God said, here's how I'm acting and what's going on here. Here's my actions to humanity. And in 12, where we just started, now it's saying, here's the people's response and reaction to that. So at salvation, you began a response to God. As mentioned, you choose how to respond to God regarding your transformation into the image of Christ. There are two things that you need to understand at the point of salvation. And if not then, as a viewer has been saved, you say, those two things I never really thought about or considered, then today would be a good day to consider it. It's never too late if you just didn't understand it or maybe it was happening in your life and say, I just didn't really comprehend. Today is still not too late to understand these two things that really should happen or should have happened immediately upon salvation. Number one is the word present. Number two is the word transform. Let's talk about present, present. So scholars claim that the tense of the verb, verb present or offer, it presupposes a decisive offering made once for all. Present myself once for all. Others say that the error uh, presupposes a decisive offering made once for all and, and that Paul meant that we should make this offering without implying how often we should do it. So some say you make this presentation of yourself to God one time, that's it, it's all done. Some say, look, it should probably be done every day you need to present yourself to God. See, in view of the nature of the commitment that Paul called for, it seems that we should make it decisively as often as we desire. What the Christian needs to present is his or her life of service to God. I think you can make that as a one-time thing, but I sure don't think it hurts to go back daily and say, God, I just want to come back to you and tell you again, I present myself to you. I'm still here, God. I'm presenting myself. I'm here for service to you. And I don't think it hurts to do that on a daily basis. I don't think it hurts to do it every minute. Say, God, I'm here. I'm presenting myself to you salvation. I'm still presenting myself to you. See, in Israel, the whole burnt offering, which represented the entire person of the offerer, burned up completely on the altar. You know any of how that happened back at that point in time? You bring it, uh, the person doing the sacrifice puts it on there and it burns. You cannot get it back. It is gone. Holy, completely. It is burned up. The offerer could not reclaim it because it belongs to God. You present your sacrifice. It's given. It's burned. It's gone. It's out of there. You can't say, made a mistake on that one. Bring it back to me. You present it, and it is burned up and it's out of there. See, whether it's one time or often, you are to present yourself, a living sacrifice to God, wholly and completely. And this pleases God and is an act of worship. So do you always have to sing a song to worship God? Present yourself to Him as a living, whole, complete sacrifice. And it says here, you have done an act of worship right there. See, when you come to worship, when you worship somewhere on your own, it doesn't matter. You worship here, you're singing in your quiet time, which I hope and pray all of you have. It doesn't matter. But when you're worship, you should be reminded that you are presenting yourself to God wholly. Because now, next time you worship, try that. Try the experience of saying, God, 
I present myself to you as a living sacrifice, holy, completely, and then worship. And actually, you're, you're worshiping as you say that, because that's what it says. But can you imagine that Sunday when you come here, and the music is starting, and you're saying, hey God, I know the music's starting, but I just need to tell you something. I present myself to you today as a living sacrifice, holy and complete to you. And then trial worship. Because you know what? what the act of worship is humility, isn't it? And when we walk in the door a lot of times, let's, let's admit it. I admit it. I'm the door, and I've been through life, and I've been knocking this one down and hitting this one. I think I'm pretty doggone good at life. And I walk in, and all of a sudden I realize, wait, 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 that's me. And there wasn't really a lot of God in that today, or this week. And all of a sudden I come in, and I realize, wait a minute. It's about God. Remember, I am second God's first. The next time you go to worship, Say, God, I just want to present myself to you. And God, I probably, I know I presented myself to you as salvation. God, I just want to, to reiterate. I'm still present. I'm still there, God. I present myself to you as a living sacrifice, wholly and completely, and then see what happens when you worship. See, presenting yourself is hard to do. It means yielding completely. So I mentioned before that I was in a fraternity in college. How many of you have heard me say that? I was in a fraternity in college. And at the end of the, the pledge process became the hazing process. Now, you know, there's a lot mentioned about a lot of fraternities and hazing. And I think I've told you before, I was in Bobby Alpha Symphonia, which was supposed to be a service fraternity. And we really were. We were supposed to serve the music department of our university. Now, i got to do a little bit small aside here. How many of you know a couple of weeks ago, ULM, my alma mater, beat number eight Arkansas? How many of you know two weeks ago they took Auburn to overtime, but they lost? And then how many of you know Friday night they came very close, but they did lose to Baylor? How many of y'all care about that? No, okay, let's just go on with it. Anyway, <laughs> while I was at Northeast Louisiana University, which is now called ULM, and I'm getting into the 5U Alpha Symphonia fraternity, and, and I've been gone through the pledge process, and now they, and they haze, and they did a little bit of something. So anyway, here's what they did. They told us one late night, you know, to show up at the campus. And so we show up at the campus, and as we arrive, they blindfold us, and then they place us in a car, and they tell us this. They say, we are taking you to a swamp to walk you around. We're in a car, blindfolded, and all you hear are the words, we're driving you to a swamp to walk around. Well, we get out of the car, and we start walking, and of course, your mind's eye, you are in a swamp. And you're walking around, you hear instructions like this. Oh, boy, watch out for the water. Uh, a few minutes later, you hear, uh, hey, oh, 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 you're about to step on snake. Back up, back up, back up. Hey, hey, you over there, duck, duck, you're fixing to hit a branch. Hey, you, 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 walk to your left. Oh, you, oh man, you almost hit that tree. Oh, lean right, or you're going to have moss in your face. Now, I don't even know in Louisiana we have moss. I don't know if you have moss over here. See, it's pretty scary to be walking in a swamp late at night, blindfolded, following the structures of somebody else. Give that a try sometime, okay? You want a real thrill, go to a swamp, put a blindfold on, and let somebody lead you. Let them give you the instructions. It's a it's pretty, pretty big thrill. Now, here was, here, here's the reality. The reality was this. When we were told to take the blindfold off, oh, we had never left the campus. <laughs> They just drove us around, around, put us on some grass, and walked us around for a while. But, but I, you, I'm blind, but it's far. I mean, you just, you're in the swamp. So they drove us around, got us out some grass, just walked us around, but it was for real. Now, see, at that point, when I got there and they put the blindfold on, basically, I had to present myself to them. I had to say, look, I basically put my life in your hands because I'm a pledge and you're in charge, you're saying days, put the blindfold on, so whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. So basically, I'm presenting myself to you, to these fraternity members, and now I look back at some of them, I'm going, why did I do that? But anyway, I did anyway. Submit your instruction, I had to do that to become a member of 5 New Alpha Fraternity. God says, at the point of salvation, present yourself, submit yourself totally to me, and I will lead you. See, maybe we need to put blindfolds on and say, God, 
lead me through life. If I see one of those blind foes we're off and we're going through life, like I said a few minutes ago, and then we puff up a little bit, we think, we've got this, and we, we can make it, God, and hey, we'll call you, be on standby, we'll do it. But you know what? If we put blind foes on, and we have to walk through life, we have to say, God, God, you have to be in front of me constantly. I cannot see a thing. I present myself wholly, totally to you. Once the presentation of yourself to God has taken place, once you have submitted, once you have given wholly to Him, then the process of transformation begins. Look at number two. Transform. In chapter 12 of Romans, verse 1, it deals with making the commitment. When you look at verse 1 and the verse we read a few minutes ago, it deals with the commitment. Present. I'm presenting myself to you. I am committing. Verse 2 deals with maintaining it and beginning to transform. Everybody understand that? Verse 1, I commit. I present myself to you. Verse 2, I'm in the process. I'm maintaining. I'm transforming. The first verse calls for an explicit act. Do something. Commit. The second commands a lifelong process. These verses are called for an act of presentation and the duty of transformation. See, actually, before you transform, there was something else they said to do. Anybody want to kind of see if you can remember? What did the verse of Scripture say before it got into the part about transform? It said something before it says transform. Cannot be conformed. Actually, before you transform, you have to do something, Aaron. You have to stop conforming to the world. See, conforming to the world is the nature of a lost person. Isn't that right? I mean, that when you're born, you're lost, and that's, going, that's your nature. You're going to conform to the world. That is your nature. Darrell Robinson, he was one of my former pastors, and he used to say this. Why do lost people act the way they do? Because they're lost. I'm just saying, right? That's good. Why? If you look at somebody, if you're dealing with somebody out in the world, and they're acting a certain way, and you go, why do they act that way? If they're not a Christian, natural. They're acting lost. They don't have anything in their life necessarily to base how you act or what you do, other than maybe their upbringing or, you know, inside them maybe they're a good person. But as far as their overall act, they're lost. So I guess they're going to act like they're lost. They are conforming to the ways of the world. They are really acting pretty natural. To see, the unnatural thing occurs after salvation. And that is to not conform to the world and start your transformation away from the world to being the image of Christ. And what is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Well, wait, maybe I shouldn't ask that. But I mean, everybody has something different. I mean, when, what is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Just think about it. Whatever it may be, it's probably the same thing every day. Most people are very, uh, have a routine. I'm pretty much routine. I have certain things that within a certain period of time when I get up, I'm pretty much... I'm going to fall in that routine. Everyone seems to have their own special ritual to get them going in the moment, in the morning. Maybe you have to have a cup of coffee. Anybody in that part? Before you start the day. Maybe you make your bed as soon as you get up. Whoa, that was low on the total boat. Now, I didn't used to do that when we went to a family reunion. And I, and I made, my mom taught me. My goodness gracious, she taught me how to make a bed and not supposed to make my bed up. But I have to admit, as I got older, I got a little bit lax in that department. We were in a at a family reunion one day, and one of my cousins, and my city really admires and respects, he's a great guy, and he said, oh man, I'm, I'm just uh, obsessive compulsive about making a bed. As soon as I'm out of bed, I make that bed. Of course, and he's like, oh, isn't that the greatest thing in the world? That's just awesome. It's just super. So guess what? Every day when I get up, pretty much in a short period of time, I make the bed. Everybody give me a hand. <laughs> All right, maybe you do that. Maybe you make your bed as often like you do. Maybe you jump right in the shower. Um, um, others have to brush their teeth. There's, there's some people very obsessive compulsive about the teeth. Cindy Pretty, she like that. She got to get her teeth brushed. Some of you may start your ritual the night before. Some of you put the coffee water in the automatic coffee. Who do, do does that? So they're ready to go. Or you lay out your clothes. You will wear it for the next morning. But some part of everyone's morning ritual is coming face to face with a mirror. Right. How many of you never look in a mirror before you leave? Oh my goodness gracious. All right, well hey, that's everybody has their thing. Most, most of us probably get our first look at ourselves while we're still pretty scary looking. 
Our eyes have that clear days look. Our hair is sticking out in strange places. Now that's me. But I, I'm just telling you. When I get up in the morning, it's everywhere on my head. And if I don't immediately jump in the shower and get it watered or whatever, I put a hat on. We've got company. I'm going to go out with cap on. But I mean, it is everywhere. It's very true for me. Normally, clean-shaven guys have some scruffy overnight growth of beards to deal with. A lot of us do. Facing our mirrors first thing in the morning is not the most pleasant of experiences for some of us. Now, some of you may step in front of that mirror and go, you were beautiful yesterday. You were beautiful. All right. For me, I, uh, I know which side we all are, but for me, I look, I'm just like, that's the scariest thing I've seen. Mirrors are very honest little things, aren't they? They do not compromise. In fact, the, the better the mirror, the more the defects that we see. They show us our wrinkles. They show every gray hair. No comments for me. In fact, the better the mirror, the more flaws we will see. So why do we all have mirrors in our bathrooms? Why do we do that? Well, because as unpleasant as it may be to confront our faces the first thing in the morning, we know that we have to do it so that others will not see what we see. Right? As a matter of fact, the rest of the world is going to see what we see. If they saw what they saw in me, they would be doing the whole, whole thing. How many of y'all coming home alone? I mean, Oh, oh yeah, wait, yeah, is that before everybody's time in here? Remember the kid in the home alone, you know? If you saw me first thing in the morning, why don't you just give me a home alone, okay? What is your life reflecting to the world? A mirror is going to say, when you get up, this is it, buddy. I'm not lying to you. <laughs> this is the way she looks. What is your life reflecting to the world? What is being reflected in your life for others to see? Do they see a Christian in the transformation process in a rowboat rowing with the current? Now we're back at that illustration. Are you a Christian in the rowboat going with the flow and rowing with it? That means the flow is God transforming you and you are rowing doing something to help and be a part of that. Remember what we said at the very beginning. Now is that where you are in the transformation process? Or are you a Christian sitting in the rowboat, the flow's going, maybe a little bit of transformation, and you're just sitting and the boat's going down the river? Or are you a Christian sitting in the rowboat and you're trying to go against the current? Transformation needs to happen. God's trying to transform me, and my life needs to change. I need to get away from this thing from the world, but I'm just going to buck it a little bit, and I'm going to go against the current. Everybody have that illustration in mind? Well, let me conclude with this. Let's sum it up. Present yourself to God, a living sacrifice, totally and wholly submitting to Him. Then begin the process of transforming into the image of Christ. It's important to remember, do not be conformed to the world. We just touched on it a few minutes ago. The world will do everything it can to squeeze you into its mold. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you would agree with me that that's true? The world is not out there inactive. Let's just put it that way. We don't walk out and go out in the world and, and man, nothing's going to happen. You walk out in the world, let's be honest, the world is doing everything it can to transform us or for us to conform to it. Is that right? The Christian should be continually renewing his or her mind by returning mentally to the decision to dedicate self to God, presenting, and by reaffirming that decision. This continual rededication to God will result in the transformation of the Christian into Christ's image. A continual rededication. So how long has it been since you rededicated your life? I'm just going to ask that question. Just think about it. Just, I'm just going to give you a second to think. How, and I'm not necessarily talking about Sunday morning, walk up front, take the preacher by the hand, say, preacher, I just want you to know. I'm rededicating my heart and life. I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm just talking about when was the last time you said to God, hey God, I'm pretty much at the point right now, I need to rededicate. I look at my life and maybe my dedication, my commitment, my presenting is not as strong as it used to be. And, and I need to do something about it. See, sometimes I think we tend to rededicate our lives in the midst of something happening in our lives, right? I mean, let's be real honest. 
when do we tend to rededicate our lives? Something has happened in our lives, an unpleasant, unpleasant event. Something's happened, and uh, tragedy. Something's gone wrong. Our lives are a mess. So you know what? My life is a mess, God. So you know what? Maybe I just need to rededicate my life. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But sometimes God gets our attention, right? Sometimes something goes wrong in our life, and whoa, wake up, hey! You better rededicate your life because now you see that your life is a mess and there are problems and complications and you need to rededicate. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but rededication doesn't have to be or need to be the result of an event in our lives. Rededication can occur. Presenting yourself to God as a living sacrifice can happen daily. If nothing else, it's a reminder. The transformation process is, is a daily process. And, and God, today I get up and I just want to tell you, God, I keep, I, I'm presented to you. I'm here. I'm holy. And God, I know we're in that process. And, and I'm rolling with you, God. You're in the, we're in the current. And today, God, I just know that you're going to transform me some more into your life. God, go for it. Please, thank you. I, I want that in my life. I want to go away from the world. I want to go towards you in righteousness. So the transforming of the mind does not take place overnight. But it's a lifelong process by which our way of thinking is to resemble more and more the way God wants us to think. Pulling away from the ways of the world and thinking like God. Do you understand that's the process as a Christian? Is every day you're supposed to get up and think more like God and less like the world? That's the process. That's the process of becoming righteous. Because now my life is thinking right things. God things. Instead of wrong things and wrong things. I'm transforming. Doesn't happen overnight. Some denominational religions, whatever, kind of teach that. Hey, you become a Christian, boom, that perfection's not there. Something wrong with you. Better get it wrong. Doesn't happen. You become a Christian. And God says, We're in that process of transforming. I'm going to transform you into my likeness and the righteousness. And you know what? I want you to partner with that. And every day you're in the robot. So who aids, as we look at this, let's just say it at the end, who aids in this process? We know the Holy Spirit does. Let's just talk very quickly about many people seek God's will. And I think I even preached on this a while back. Because this, this scripture says this. I just want to touch on it as we close. Who aids us in this process? The Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is God's will 101. You want to write it down. Okay? And people ask, I don't know God's will. I just don't know God's will. I'm struggling right now. I don't know God's will for mine. This verse of Scripture gives the formula for God's will. We clarify what God's will for us is by, is by rededicating ourselves to God often. God's will sometimes is blurred when our commitment to Him wavers. However, it's always good. Notice that total commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is prerequisite for experiencing God's will. So sometimes when people are saying, I don't know God's will, look, are, are, you, are you in that transforming process? Are you presenting yourself to God? Or are you committed wholly to Him? Because the Bible says that's how you know His will. If you're way off somewhere and God's here and He's never moved, and you're saying, I don't know God's will, and you're saying, well, no wonder, look here, look at the distance between you and God. And this is saying, look, put yourself right here. So, Today, go home if you need to and say, I need, God, I need to know your will. Before I need to know that, I'm presenting myself to you. Holy, totally committed, and I want that transformation process. And that really is the will of God. That's God's will. Do you understand that on the whole of it, we look at it as individual. What, what happened today? And I don't know if that's God's will. I need to get this or buy this or do this. The whole of God's will is that right there. God's will is that you present yourself to Him. Totally, holy, Give everything to Him, and you start the transformation process. That's God's will for your life. Now, if you're there, I can pretty much guarantee you that as those daily things come up, you're going to see and hear and find more answers and more peace. I'm telling you, you're going to hear a yes. I'm not going to tell you it's going to happen soon. But if you're there and you're saying, God, I'm here, and I have a situation in my life, and God, I'm just going to depend upon you. I'm going to trust you. And I know, God, you're going to give me the answer. And I'll be my answer, God. Because, see, when you're here, that's how you pray, isn't it? 
You don't say, when you're over here, you're going, God, I have a situation, you better fix it right now, because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to take place. God, come on, God, sir, I'm up, God. It's like the genie. Boop, 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 boop. Come on, God. But when you're here, you're thinking like God. And you're saying, God, I love you and I need you. I, I know I'm in your will because I, I'm obedient and I'm doing everything I can to commit. And now, God, I have a daily situation I need to know your will. God, just lead me through this. And guide me through this. Very quickly here, got a little demonstration and we're closing it out. Cody's been working the whole sermon on this, I think, to try to get it. This is a transformer, okay? Now, Cody, did you get it? Will it transform back? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Cody is going to give us a little demonstration here. Now, Cody, can you hold? You, does it take very long to do it? All right, you got it. All right. Now, it's back to the original. And so let's think about this for a minute. We're going to close out. You see it's now, it's a robot. Is that right, Cody? Hold it up. Everybody see it. It is now a robot. It almost got it. Uh, that's Close to a robot. Now. All right. Everybody see the robot? So now it's a robot. Now, if he were to put it into a machine, okay? See, many Christians do this. Now, as he's doing this, it kind of, you, you can turn and give them the visual. Then we'll see it. All right? Many Christians hold it like that. Stay a robot, believe it or not. They start no transformation process at all. They just stay a robot. No transformation. They're conformed to the world, even as a Christian. Some Christians start the process, kind of start a little bit there, Cody. But they allow the world to back into their lives, and they go from a machine, and now kind of take it back to a robot. Back to a robot. That is not totally committed to transforming the image of Christ. Kind of in between them. Turn it all the way, Cody. Some Christians start the transformation process and go from robot completely to the machine. Completely transforming the image of Christ. However long God chooses or that, that takes. I'm going to ask you this as we close. Which one are you? Are you conformed to the world with no transformation? Okay, think about that for a minute. Are you conformed to the world? You, you say... I'm a Christian. You know what, Carl? I'm going to be honest today. I'm conformed to the world. Number two. Carl, I'm a Christian today, and there's some transformation, and some days I'm working at it, some days I forget about it, some days I just feel like I'm in the world, and other days I'm trying to fight you know, between the two, trying to make it happen and work. Carl, I'm kind of call in between a little bit. Or you may say, Carl, totally. I just want you to know I am totally presented to God, and I'm daily transforming into His image. Now, which one are you? So go back to my original title. Me, a transformer? Me, a transformer? Yes, you a transformer. Yes, I am transforming from a worldly human to a likeness of God. You are a transformer. You're in a transformation process. God is doing His part. He's the current. And you have the choice. You're either sitting in the rowboat going against God in His current. We're sitting in the robot boat doing absolutely nothing in the relationship to transform. Or you're in the rowboat and you got through four. And you're saying, God, you and I are partnering together on this. And I'm not going to conform to the world. I presented myself to you. And I am working the transformation process. Let's work it together. But I'm God. Me, I transform. God, we thank you so much today for this opportunity of being here and for your message. And just pray, God, as we come before you, even in this series, that God is so eye-opening to me to understand and to know these wonderful truths. The truth of this eternal relationship. God, the truth of presenting and not conforming and transforming. And I just pray that all of us can get the mental image and picture today and be able to, to say in our walk and our life that, God, this is where we are. This is what we're doing. God, I pray for someone who'd be here today that would say, or someone that is here today who'd say, I'm not even in the presenting, conforming, transforming, eternal relationship situation with God at all. I'm lost. I'm one of the ones you mentioned a few minutes ago, Carl, that is lost, and I act the way I am because I'm lost. God, I pray for anyone who's here to say, I'm lost and I want salvation. That they would come forward today by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for anyone that's here today that would say, God, I presented, maybe I didn't do it wholly and totally. 
and I didn't understand transform. God, I pray for anyone here today, as I said, I presented, I have some commitment, I have some dedication, but I'm always torn between the, the world and the transforming to righteousness. God, I pray for the ones here that says, I have totally committed to you, God, and I am in that transformation process daily. And God, thank you for this. And God, let's work together. God, I pray for anyone that wants to come today and spend some time in communion with you and maybe evaluate because you say in communion to examine yourself. And so today maybe they want to come and just say, God, before I take this Lord's Supper, let me examine and see what Brother Carl said today and where I am. And then God, I pray for anyone that's here that's, that's just having a hard time and a tough time. And maybe they are having a hard time knowing your will. It's not always easy. Life can be hard. But we want to be here. We want to lift those people up to you. God, we just want to, we know that you are working with them. But we want to work with them. Help them. God, this is your invitation time. And we're going to give it to you. May the Holy Spirit work. For it's in your precious, precious holy name, I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and life today. During this time of invitation, allow the Lord.